No, they were actually too big to succeed. Giant sprawling messes, all these different departments. It was impossible to manage that effectively. You stop and think about all the different divisions, the amount of capital that was being employed, the amount of leverage of that capital. You know, when you look at the banking system in America, 65% of the banks are actually AAA rated. The problem is these are the small local banks who, crazy people that they are, they only lend money to people that can pay them back. It's a wild business uh, model. It might catch on one day. The problem is that's only 35% of the depository assets in the country. The big assets, the 65%, are held by the big banks, and these banks are just, it's not that they're too big to fail, they were so big and so unwieldy, they couldn't effectively be managed. And in the 1980s, the, re the reason they got this huge was, in the 1980s we heard from all the banks, we have to compete with Mitsubishi Tokyo and Sumitomo and some of these other giant Japanese banks. Uh, so we allowed these banks to get huge. Uh, at the same time as that happened, all these Japanese banks went belly up. They all weren't allowed to go bankrupt, but they all were fairly much turned into zombies. And for 10 years, the Japanese economy did nothing. So we let our banks get enormous in order to compete with these phantom banks in Japan that were essentially empty shells. They were dying husks. Um, and what we really should have done was keep these banks small. You know, if you believe in capitalism and you believe in competition, it's nice to have 10,000 banks all competing for your, your money, for your, for your banking dollar. And none of them, when you have that many banks, there's a tendency to prevent the sort of group thing that we got from the same 10 giant banks. You know, they were really not competing with the rest of the banking industry. They were all doing the same thing, the same stupid things. And it's why so many of the biggest banks all are suffering from the same problems. And they're going to be problematic going forward for some time. Well, they're all different situations. But as we've seen, the process of getting a bailout looks remarkably similar from company to company, sector to sector. You start out with a company that's in trouble almost always due to some bad decision making on the part of management. There's almost always leverage involved. There's always almost too much risk, too much speculation. Um, they're pretty connected in terms of both Washington DC and Wall Street. Uh, they're invariably publicly traded companies. The vast majority of them are public. And we see this process that takes place over time and it's the same 10 steps that everybody seems to go through. There's an issue, uh, people pretend it's not a big deal, it gets worse, people start inquiring what's going to happen with this, they reach out to Washington, D.C. By the time the company is really past the point of no return, um, Washington, D.C. and the regulators are starting to get nervous, and ultimately you end up at the point where there's a panic situation, people blame systemic risk when it really isn't, and you end up with a ton of taxpayer money showing up at these companies' doorsteps when Really, they're just bad companies poorly managed who should have been allowed to die a normal death like most companies eventually do.